Welcome to another... Hang on. Hello? It's for you. Imagine that you're sitting down watching your favorite turn-off video on computer organization. You're pretty involved in this, and the phone rings. You look down, and it happens to be your significant other. You pause the video, right? You pause it because you don't want to miss a, a single word that's going on in this computer organization video. And you start with a cheerful voice because you are, hey, you're in a good place because you've been studying computer organization. And you have this conversation. Now, while you're on this conversation on the phone, and, and think about it this way, your phone is on the charger. You let, it, you let the charge run down so you're tethered to the charger. You've got a cord, it's plugged into the wall, so you can't carry the phone around you, around with you, but you see at the door your dog is asking to be let out and he looks pretty urgent. So you know that, that if you don't let the dog out soon, you're gonna have a mess to clean up. So you tell your, you tell your significant other, remember what we were talking about. I'll be back in a second. I got to let the dog out. So you let the dog out. You come back to the phone. You pick up the conversation exactly where you left off. And then as soon as you finish talking, you hang up and you go back, you unpause the video and you start watching the video from where you left off without missing a single thing. Now, these interrupts are an analogy for something that is inside of the processor, a system of hardware called, you guessed it, interrupts. Now, last time, the last lesson, we talked about something called polled I.O. Now, polled I.O. was a way of communicating with an I.O. device by setting up the I.O. device, getting it started with whatever process it's doing. For example, let's say it's a timer. And maybe what you've done is you've said, okay, in one second, I want to know, well, I want to know when one second has elapsed. And so you keep going back and checking with the timer. Has a second elapsed? Has a second elapsed? Has a second elapsed? And you keep checking. Now, there's a problem with this. The problem is, is that every time you check, you're taking time away from the CPU when it could be doing something more important than simply checking to see if a flag has, has been set. That polled I.O. will reduce performance. And it's kind of required whenever you have very simple hardware you're interfacing with, but most, most systems on a, or that are connected to the input and output of a processor support this thing called an interrupt. Now, my analogy. The key behind the analogy of the phone call and the dog being let out is, is a couple of things. First of all, we have to save the state or the condition that we were in. So I was in a condition at a certain time stamp in the video, or I was at a condition on a point in our conversation, and I had to remember that so that when I came back, I could pick up where I left off. So I need to save the state. Now, whenever it comes to an interrupt, whenever it comes to something happening inside of the processor that we need to service, um, it's going to happen asynchronously, um, and this is really an important concept. So asynchronous, it's going to be an asynchronous interrupt. It could happen at any point in time in the execution of our code. So our code cannot have any sort of, any sort of mechanism to say, oh, I've been interrupted. I need to save my state. No, this is entirely on the hardware that performs the interrupt, actually in the hardware that performs the interrupt and the software that the interrupt is going to call. All right, so the saving state, this can't be done by our application, it is done by the interrupt. The other thing we have to do is we have to identify the source. So the caller ID, right? So the phone rang, caller ID, you checked caller ID and said, oh, this is my significant other. And it meant, it meant a certain way of you handling the call, right? You answered it cheerfully. What if the caller ID said unknown caller? Ah, I'm suspecting this is spam. This is somebody who is calling me that I really don't want to talk to. So you could completely ignore that phone call. Or you could answer it, but you'll answer it with a different 
a different attitude, a different, a different mode, doing it in a different mode. So we need to do two things. We need to do saving the state and we need to identify the source. And then what we can do is call a routine. Now this routine is called an interrupt service routine, otherwise known as an ISR. Okay. That's the, that's the concept, that's the theory of what we want to do whenever it comes to this I.O. getting our attention, all right? Now, a couple of these things we're going to talk about in this lesson, a couple of them we're going to talk about in the next lesson, all right? So, what are the things that we need to do in order to save state? So, the state primarily, and, th and think about the code, we talked about the memory hierarchy, right, and where does all of the real work get done? Well, it gets done in the registers. All right, now, so we need to save state. That basically means the registers. And in fact, once again, since this is happening asynchronously and we have no control over when this is happening, we don't have any mechanism in the, the application that's being interrupted to take care of saving the registers. What are some of the registers that we need to store? Well, one of them, a very important one, is the program counter. And remember, some processors call this the instruction pointer, right? That's a very important one. What if we happen to get interrupted in the middle of a compare? Remember, we one of the things that we did with these registers was we had a set of flags that identified when I compared one value to another value, and the flags were set based on one's greater than or one's less than or if they're equal. And then immediately after that, we made a decision based on the result of that compare. What if we get interrupted right in the middle there? Well, it's a good idea to also store the flags, which are part of those registers. Now, some of this is done automatically. For example, some systems just go ahead and store everything onto the stack. Now, this is really important to understand because whenever I store these registers on the stack, that's going to change my stack pointer. And when I come back to my application, I need to make sure that the stack pointer is exactly where it was when we left. So remember that whenever we do this at the very end, when we start to clean things up at the end of this routine, we need to make sure everything's put back the way it was, which means popping things off the stack to restore the registers. Another way, so registers could be stored to the stack. Some processors have a whole different set of registers. What they'll do is they'll have one set of registers that the application uses, and then when we get interrupted, we go to a new set of registers and leave those completely untouched. We just simply operate out of a new hidden set of registers called shadow registers. All right, so saving the state. We simply say, I'm gonna make sure that all the registers get put back exactly the way they were when we asynchronously interrupted our application. This can be done a number of ways with the stack and with something called shadow registers, all right? Um, which means that we want to also be able to restore these. And so the registers restored either by popping off of the stack or by switching shadow registers. All right. So you've got a general idea of how this works. Now, the function itself or the routine itself really looks a lot like a regular function routine method that you would call in software. The difference is, and we're going to talk a little bit about assembly language again, the difference is, is, we, is how to return. All right, so some processors actually have a special function. So maybe you'd have an assembly language instruction called RET, which returns from 
a function, just a regular function, or for an interrupt, they may have something called iret, which would be a return from ISR. Hopefully that all kind of sort of made it on the, probably not. I don't think I made it all on the board. But anyway, an iret, an iret would be an, a return from an interrupt service routine. All right. Now, we're talked about saving the state. Identifying the source. This is done by the hardware. And the hardware has the ability to say, um, okay, it was the timer that interrupted me. It was the, it, it was actually reset is an interrupt. It was the network interface card that interrupted me. It was whatever. Now, in some of our architectures, this is call, called an IRQ or an interrupt request. And it's kind of like caller ID. So uh, each separate piece of hardware will have its own IRQ, which will identify to the processor who's interrupting you, right? Now, another thing though that's interesting about this is because we know who is interrupting us, we can choose, believe it or not, to ignore them. And that gives us one more topic that we're gonna kind of wrap this up before we go to the next lesson and do an example. We have something called maskable interrupts or non-maskable. All right, now think about the phone call. Once again, if it came up, the caller ID came up on your phone and it said um, unknown number, you could mask that, right? You could say, I don't want to answer that. And you could completely ignore it. And there are some interrupts that are going to be ones that you're going to ignore. Some though, however, are non-maskable. For example, one of the, there's, there's hardware that will identify when some sort of a hardware error has occurred in an interaction between memory and the processor. And we don't want to ignore if there is a problem communicating with memory. We want to make sure that we flag it and say, oops, this might be corrupted data. We need to ignore it. So some interrupts are called non-maskable. The dog was a non-maskable interrupt. You don't want to ignore the dog at the door. Types of non-maskable interrupts would be things like bus errors, but also we actually have a reset set up as an interrupt. So whenever you press or get a hard reset on the processor, you want to make sure that you get interrupted so that you can perform certain routines before, so you can gracefully shut the machine down. All right. Well, Still a lot to talk about interrupts, but we're going to save that for the next lesson. Lesson. Hopefully you got an idea of what exactly we're talking about. It, once again, an interrupt is, is simply calling, having hardware call a routine in order to execute software that services an interrupt so that I don't have to keep polling I.O. to see if it's ready to communicate. There are two kinds, maskable interrupts, which means I can ignore them or not ignore them, or non-maskable interrupts, and some non-maskable interrupts include things like a reset or a bus error. We also need to save state. State basically means our registers, and there are two places we can save it. We can store it to the stack or we can store it to shadow registers. And whenever we return from our interrupt service routine, we use a different way of returning, one that makes sure that we restore things properly rather than uh, just simply returning back to the calling function because we want to make sure that the asynchronous call on our function hasn't screwed things up. So check us out with the next lesson. We'll get into more details.